Thank you, Colonel Pamsi. So this afternoon, we have four eminent speakers to speak on the theme, Professionalism in Allied Health Sciences for a Healthier Nation. Each speaker will have 20 minutes altogether. Uh, at 15 minutes, she's going to give an indicator with a red light, and then uh, at 18 minutes, another indicator, and at 20 minutes, we will stop. I'm sure they will stick to their time. Right. Uh, so I, without further ado, I'll just get on with the introduction of the first speaker, whom I know very well. Dr. Govinda Purnam Peruma, he's senior lecturer in medical education, development and research center, that's MEDAC of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Govinda, who has an MBBS from Colombo and a diploma in psychology from Colombo and a master's of medical education from Dundee and a PhD from Dundee, has served as an invited speaker, cum resource person in many international symposia and conferences. He's author of several journal articles and books he sits on editorial boards of two international medical education journals. He's a postgraduate tutor, examiner, and a resource material developer for national and international medical education courses. He has served as an advisor, visiting professor, consultant, and fellow in several academic institutes and educational projects. He's the founder co-chair of the Asia Pacific Medical Education Network, APME Net. His research interests are on assessment, including selection for training and curriculum development and evaluation. Uh, he's going to speak to us today on training in communication, teamwork, and leadership in multi-professional healthcare settings. Thank you very much, sir, for that introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will be discussing this topic in two parts. First one is on training in communication, teamwork, and leadership in general, and then how it could be applied in uh, multi-professional settings. Uh, well, this question has been answered quite a, quite a some time, yeah. but uh, it would be good to revisit. Why communication, teamwork, and leadership? Well, the evidence is replete that uh, why we should be concerned about them. There is evidence that communication and teamwork breakdowns account for approximately 50% of healthcare adverse events and 70% of sentinel events world over. Communication problems account for 43% of all cases of surgical malpractice. And furthermore, observational studies indicate that approximately one-third of communication acts in surgical operating room include an error. So then it should not be uh, any, there should not be any doubt why we should emphasize on communication, teamwork, and leadership. And this has two broad areas. One is communication skills and the other is uh, teamwork and leadership, and they are broadly termed as interpersonal skills, and interpersonal skills are also, uh, they also belong to a broader area called soft skills as opposed to hard skills. Hard skills are things which are related to subject matter, the technical material, and soft skills are these, communication, teamwork, which are called interpersonal skills, as well as other things such as uh, ethics, attitudes, and so on. And they contribute to professionalism immensely. So how do we teach interpersonal skills? And by interpersonal sp skills, I mean communication skills, teamwork, and leadership. Well, if you take these two as examples, we used to break down these big topics into several parts, such as the medical interview or the medical consultation, breaking bad news, or communicating with special groups. And all these can be either verbal or nonverbal. And that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? How do we teach them? Well, there are several theoretical models to guide us. And what are they? Well, for the medical interview, there is 
what is known as Cal Calgary Cambridge model, and there are six components of it, of, of that model, and each component has several subcategories. And I'm not going to give a lecture on that. I, I just wanted to show these models. Uh, and then about breaking bad news, I think most of you may have heard about Spikes model, which means settings, per perception of the condition, invitation from the patient, knowledge, explore emotions and sympathize, and finally strategy and summary. And these are models, theoretical models, that people use more often. How about teamwork and leadership? Similarly, we will break down that into several components such as what are teams, what are the components of teams, what is teamwork, and the competencies related to teamwork. And for example, the, there are a lot of theoretical models for that. And then examples are the life cycle of a team or a group. They say that there is a four-stage life cycle, and for those four stages are forming, storming, norming, performing. And similarly, people have identified a lot of competencies related to teamwork. These are all theoretical models that I'm showing you. And these are the common things that people use to teach co communication skills, teamwork, and leadership. However, all these are theoretical models. They are good to clarify the concepts. However, there is a challenge in training. You cannot really teach these and be complacent that your students or the learners will be experts on these abilities. Why? Because these are soft skills. And what's so great about soft skills, or what's so peculiar about soft skills? In soft skills, theoretical models do not always equate to training models. So if you are using theoretical <coughs> models, in combination you will have to use some training models. Otherwise, you will giving you will be giving a theoretical understanding about these, which may not be translated into practice. So why can't we use theoretical models as they are for soft skills training? Well, there is a fundamental difference that probably all of us needs to should need should understand. And what is that? Un unlike hard skills. Soft skills have a small theoretical base and a large practice base. So in that sense, soft skills are diametrically opposite to hard skills. So if I show you graphically, these are hard skills, the technical matter. They are, there is a huge theoretical base and a small practice base. Everybody should be able to understand it if you go, can go through any of your uh, timetables. There will be a lot of theory input and a few practical hours. However, soft skills are different. There is a small theory base. In fact, theory base can be picked up as they go along, in fact. But there is a large practice base. And by teaching theoretical models, what we will do be doing is we'll be addressing this theory base. And if we ignore the practice base, most of the students will not be benefited by that teaching. So then, our challenge is to address the practice base. So the approach should be, the small theory part can be taught in any way that you want in a small course, maybe a foundation course. But what is more important is this large component that is the practice base. And for that we should give opportunities for the trainee or the learner to practice as much as they like. So in organizing this practice base, there are a few principles that we should follow. One is that it should be organized as a longitudinal track, not as a one-off course that people do and forget about. Second is it should not be taught in isolation. It should be taught in combination with other subjects and integrated into other subjects. So having a communication skills module alone will not be enough. It should be allowed to be practiced in all the other modules. Uh, teaching, learning, and assessing soft skills along with the subject matter of hard skills of other subjects. Then 
addressing a combination of soft skills holistically rather than one at a time. So this case is about communication skills, this case is about ethics, and this case is about teamwork and leadership won't be realistic. Usually in practice, we do those all together, and we should be taught also in the same way. Then, all the, if all this is to be taught and learned, the answer is nothing but student-centered learning. And whether they have learned or not, we should assess. And that should be right along the way. Continuous assessment is our activity goal. Not a written paper at the end of the course. So what are the types of student-centered learning methods that we can adopt? Well, the list is enormous. And this is only a segment can be any small group setting, such as problem base or small, any type of small group setting. Projects, debates, dramas, student-led seminars and presentations, practical classes, industrial training, activity-based lectures. So lectures themselves are not that bad if, if you make them activity-based and interactive. That may be okay. Peer teaching and learning, quizzes, portfolios, and the list goes on and on. Uh, what is important is, you can use the same methods to assess the student. If the student gives a presentation, you can assess and give feedback. That's the first part of the talk. The second part is how these general principles can be applied in multi-professional settings. How to teach in multi-professional settings? Well, it's commonly termed as interprofessional education or IPE. And what is IPE? There is an often quoted uh, definition of IPE, that is interprofessional education occurs when two or more professions learn with, from, and about each other to improve collaboration and quality of care. And I like this definition because it's in three parts, and the first part addresses what, second part addresses how, and the third part addresses the impact. So what is learning to all more professions together, how is with, from, or about uh, each other, and the impact would be improved collaboration and quality of healthcare. So ladies and gentlemen, this definition follows a simple rule. Simple yet compelling. That is, if we want collaborative practice in a multi-professional setting, then we should be taught also in a similar way, in a collaborative, multi-professional setting. Right, for that, there are a few models. What I'll be doing is I'll be ha talking about three models based on the second line of this definition, second bullet point, that is learning with, from, and about. So first model is learning with each other, and that is the simplest. And I know for a fact that KDU is practicing that. That is this. You put all the students in different professions together and give a lecture of a mutually important subject. That's better than nothing. However, there is some way to go because that will give them some identity and they will know each other, but that's where it stops. The second model goes a little bit beyond that. That is learning from each other. That will make stronger ties between the professions. And that's something like this, where they can discuss and learn on a common theme. But if you go even further, probably the best model would be learning about each other. That is, learning on the job or learning in a simulated setting, where they will appreciate the role of each other for a common task, and also they will appreciate the effect that and the contribution that each other will provide to accomplish a task. So, in summary, and sorry, before that, after such a, such a setting, there are two important things that should follow. One is feedback, which we call a debriefing session, and then following which they should reflect upon it and see where they went, uh, went wrong and see what they did well. So in summary, there are some do's and don'ts with regard to 
training in communication and teamwork and leadership in multi-professional settings. First, the main part, the practice part of it, not really the theoretical part, should be in, uh, organized as a longitudinal track. They should, they should be integrated with other subjects rather than thought in isolation. Addressed in combination, not alone as communication, ethics, and attitudes, and so on. And student-centered learning methods go a long way in imparting this and making sure that the students have the right, right skills uh, at the end of the day. Then, along with such student-centered methods, you can always assess those uh, activities and give some feedback to the student, and those should be right along the course, not at only at the end of the course. And those assessment also should not be an assessment on communication skills or assessment of on teamwork, but they should be also integrated with other hard skills. And finally, all this should happen in an interprofessional education setting where the best model would be learning about each other more than learning with or learning from each other. Thank you very much.